Now, what are we going to begin by doing? Praying. So let's do that together, okay? Father in heaven, we come before you this evening and we are thrilled. You have put a joy in our hearts. Father, we ask that as we open your word tonight, that you would open our hearts, that we may understand with clarity and with accuracy the great things that you are teaching us out of your word. Father, please, may we tonight have an experience, an extraordinary experience with you, not because of a man, but because of the man Jesus Christ. So please, Father, be with us now as we open your word. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Okay, let's begin with just a little bit of review. And uh, we'll look to the screen here. Last night we did the actual, certain, definite, unavoidable uh, identity of the Antichrist figure. We saw from the Bible that the Antichristian figure is none other than the Roman church state. It fits all of the identifying characteristics and we gave you ten of them. It was a little kingdom. It came up among them after them, plucked up three, and was diverse or different from the others. Those are the first five. Then it had a prominent man at its head that guided it and spoke for it, spoke words of blasphemy. You remember the three biblical definitions of blasphemy? Claims to be able to forgive sins, claims to be God on earth, and persecutes the people of God in the name of God. All of those are met by that power. Then it would think to change times and laws, but not just some Sterling Heights ordinance. It would think to change the very times and laws of... God, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, and then ruled for 1,260 prophetic days or literal years. So let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Again, this is review, but just listen to this powerful verse describing part of the enterprises of this antichrist, anti Christian power. It says, He shall speak pompous words against who? The Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change what? times and laws. That's one of the identifying characteristics. We put this up on the screen last night. Let's read it again quickly. This is from Lucius Ferrari's Prompta Bibliotheca, an article entitled Papa. Literally scores, probably hundreds and thousands of references just like this could be given, but I just give you this one very quickly. The Bishop of Rome is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even what? divine laws. Now, there might not be any problem with explaining or interpreting, but there would be a significant problem with this word right here, modify. What does the word modify mean? It means to change. That's exactly what Daniel 7.25 said, that he would think to change the very times and laws of God. The Bishop of Rome can modify divine law since his power is not of man, but of God, and he acts as vicegerent or representative of God upon the earth. Now, go to your study guide there, and let's begin with our two-part series entitled The Rock That Simply Will Not Roll. And I want to let you know, when we come back together on Thursday, Thursday night, what night, everyone? Thursday. Thursday we have an extremely important and exciting announcement that we're going to be making, and I'm not very good at keeping secrets that I'm excited about, but uh, I'm not going to spill the beans tonight, so Thursday night we have an exciting announcement. It's not just the message, it's an announcement, and it involves Scott Moore, the young man who was just up here. I'll tell you more about it on Thursday, but let's go to our study guide. It says, we live in a time in which very few things are solid and lasting. Can you say amen to that? Amen. The promises and pledges of politicians are fleeting. The moral values of society are increasingly in flux. The economy can be strong, then weak, then strong again, all in a short time. Even the most stable and secure jobs can be lost in a moment, and I probably should have added, especially in Michigan. And a seemingly stable marriage can fall to pieces in short order. Life is unstable, uncertain, and prone to dramatic upheavals. Life is characterized by change more than what? Stability, yet the human heart longs for solidity and stability. In this lesson, we will see that there is a source of unmovable and unshakable stability. We will see that there is something that can be trusted to last even through life's uncertain times and storms and anchor a rock that won't roll. Tradition or Scripture? Now, I'd like to draw your attention here to 
A quotation that is on the screen, this is taken from Adrian Ampen's Doctrine Defined by the Council of Trent. And this is what the Roman Church State says. Tradition, not Scripture, is the rock on which the church of Jesus Christ is built. Now notice that. There is a foundation, there is a bedrock upon which the church is built. This is the claim of the Roman Church State. But that bedrock is what? Tradition and is not... Scripture. Now look at that, right under the subheading, Tradition or Scripture. There are many differences that separate the Roman church state from Scripture-based believers. But the central difference is found in the disparate emphases put on tradition versus Scripture. And that is essential. Tradition versus Scripture. One camp has the former as the foundation. The other camp has the latter. The word tradition, what word, everyone? The word tradition occurs, guess how many times in the Bible? Somebody take a guess. 100 times? No. Zero? No. 13 times. 13 times in the Bible, and all and only two of them are positive in context. In other words, 13 times in the Bible, all of them in the New Testament, and only two of them are positive. In other words, tradition in a scriptural context you, you find was consistently something negative. Now, we'll talk about what makes for a good tradition and what makes for a bad tradition in just a moment. Not all traditions are bad. Uh, it goes on to say, consider, for example, the following text. Now, there are many texts there, Matthew 15, but look at this one here. Mark chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus speaking, he was speaking to the religious leaders of his day who had established various traditions that caused them to actually ignore and neglect the words and the law of God. And Jesus said, you make the word of God of no effect through your traditions which you have handed down and many such things you do. So notice in Jesus' mind when scripture and tradition came into conflict, when the word of God and tradition came into conflict, which one was given precedence? Which one was given priority? Scripture, of course. He said, hey, listen, you guys make of none effect the words of God by your traditions that you've handed down from generation to generation. He said, you do this about many things. There are several passages there that you can look up on your own time, but what you find in these passages is, is that tradition in this context is not given a positive connotation. Notice the last paragraph there on the study guide. There is nothing wrong with traditions per se. Can you say amen to that? For example, one of the traditions that we have in the family that I grew up in is every Christmas morning, my mom would make these things called sticky buns. You know what sticky buns are? Whoo, I tell you, my mouth's salivating right now just thinking about them. And uh, they were probably 100% bad for you, but there was so much motherly love in them that we never died from eating them. And uh, they just were basically sugar and white bread and butter and cinnamon and yum. And every, twin, every December 25th, you just... I mean, we were excited about the presents, but I was more excited about those sticky buns. Anything wrong with that tradition? No, because that tradition doesn't go against the law of God. That tradition doesn't go against the Bible. Are we clear on that? But the problem comes when you have a tradition or an idea that comes into conflict with what God says. And in that circumstance, what God says must not be made subordinate to a tradition. Does that make sense, everyone? Nothing wrong with traditions. Every night we have a tradition here. We, we have our little guys come up and they, you know, do their introduction. They smile with their pearly whites. Nate tries to not look awkward in an awkward situation. It's kind of a little tradition of ours. Nothing wrong with that tradition. But if that tradition was somehow in conflict with God's Word, then we would have to jettison the tradition and keep the Bible. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, so let's continue. There's nothing wrong with traditions per se, but when traditions conflict with the commands of God, there is a problem. One must be made subordinate to the other. The Roman church state makes Scripture bow to tradition, while Scripture-based believers, of which I am one, would insist that traditions bow to God's command and word. This is the essential difference between these two camps. Okay? There are many differences, but the essential difference that separates adherence to the Roman church state's philosophy and the scripture-based philosophy is what prominence, what position do we give to tradition? And again, I want to emphasize, there is nothing wrong with tradition so long as those traditions don't go over and against what God's Word says. Are we all clear on that? Amen. Top of the second page. It is significant to note that the word law occurs approximately, guess how many times? 
500 times in the Bible. Now think about that. The word law occurs some 500 times. How many times did I say the word tradition occurs? 13 times. The word commandments occurs some 350 times. The simple difference in numerical occurrence between tradition and law commandments is telling indeed. In other words, just from that, even if you didn't even look up any of the verses, you have law 500 times, commandments 350 times, tradition 13 times, of which only two are positive. That tells you that tradition is going to be made subordinate to the Word of God. Are we all clear on that? Very simple. Let's continue. The Antichrist and God's law is the subheading on page two of the study guide. Last lesson we learned that one of the identifying characteristics of the Antichrist is that he would intend. What word is that? Yeah. Intend to change times and laws. Think of it. The Antichrist is so bold as to think that it can change the very law of God. Can this power actually change the law of God? Yes or no? No, in order to change the law of God, he'd have to go to heaven. Somehow he'd have to figure out how to get there. Then he'd have to go up to God, take him off of his throne, and then change his law. No man can do that. No power can do that. No church can do that. No tradition can do that. That's why the, the Bible doesn't say that he does change the law of God, but that he intends to change, or King James says, he thinks to change the times and laws of God. But even to intend this is amazing enough. Now, with this sort of backdrop in your mind, go with me to the book of Revelation, and I want to show you a fascinating contrast. We go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation what chapter, everyone? 12. Revelation chapter 12. And I want you to notice this remarkable contrast. Now, we've already spent a whole lot of time in Revelation chapter 12. We're going to spend a whole lot more time there. But I want to direct your attention to the final verse, the climax of all of Revelation chapter 12. Incidentally, as I've already told you, many scholars and commentators believe that Revelation chapter 12 is the climax of the whole book. So if Revelation 12, 17 is the pinnacle of Revelation 12, and Revelation 12 is the pinnacle of the whole book, then that would tell you that this would be the pinnacle verse of the whole book. And look at the book verse. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It says, And the dragon, and the who? Dragon. The dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. And Satan was enraged with the woman. Who's a woman? In Bible prophecy, God's true church. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So in other words, the, the dragon would make this all-out frontal assault on God's last day people, and John says these last day people keep God's commandments. Now look at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. You're there in Revelation 12, 17. Look at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. It says, Here is the patience, or if you prefer, the endurance of the saints. Who are the saints, everyone? And what you should say is, we are. we are. Amen? So who are the saints, everyone? We are. we are. Here is the endurance of the saints. Here are those who keep the traditions of men. No, 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 no. What does it say? Here are those who keep the commandments of God, and they also have... Now, look at those two verses. One says the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. One says they keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Listen, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus go hand in hand. Can you say amen? In fact, you can't even keep the commandments of God if you don't have faith in Jesus. Paul says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. You can't even do one good thing without Jesus Christ in your life. Amen? And even if you did do something good, it's probably for selfish reasons. And the Apostle Paul says, should we do evil that good may come? Even the best that we do apart from Christ is not good enough. You need the faith relationship with Jesus and the commandments of God. They go together like two legs or two wings. Are we all together, everyone? Okay, so notice that. Now go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, and I'm looking at verse 14. How many of you want to go to heaven? How many of you want to go to the New Jerusalem? Okay, well then guess what you're going to be doing? Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. Blessed are those who do His commandments, commandments that they may have the right to the tree. tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. city. Do you know what city that is? That's the New Jerusalem. So how many people here tonight want to go to the New Jerusalem someday? Want to go to heaven? Okay, then you're all going to be commandment keepers. Not in order to gain the favor of God, but because God has already bestowed His favor upon you in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? 
Now look at that, three verses. Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 14, 12, Revelation 22, 14. John in Revelation says, the last day people will keep the commandments. The last day people will keep God's commandments. The last day people will keep God's commandments. I have a question for you tonight. Do you think God's last day people are going to keep His commandments? That's exactly what the Bible says. Now what's remarkable here is that concerning God's law, one camp... Let's see, concerning God's law, one camp says, do away, and the other seeks to honor and obey. That's right on your study guide. One camp says we can modify, change, and interpret the laws of God, and the other camp says, no, we'll keep God's law by faith. We'll keep God's law by His grace. We'll keep God's law by His power. Okay? So that's a remarkable contrast there in Revelation. We'll see that develop further and still further and still further. That God's faithful people will be obeying God and the anti-Christian power will be seeking to do away with the very laws and times of God. Okay? We're back to the study guide there. Hopefully you're getting everything filled in. And it says, which is the rock upon which the church of Jesus Christ is built? Okay? That's a question that is often asked. And Scripture is absolutely clear on this point. Jesus Christ is the rock. Can you say amen? Jesus Christ is the rock. Concern the, consider the following text that unmistakably established this. Some people say, well, wait a minute. I thought that Jesus built His church upon Peter. I mean, isn't that, isn't that what He said there? I'm going to build my church upon Peter. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Let's look at a few texts, though. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. It says, And all drank the same spiritual drink. Okay? This is Paul recounting the experience of Moses and the people in the wilderness. Okay? They all drank the same spiritual drink in the wilderness, for they drank of that spiritual what? Rock, rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ. Now, is that plain enough, everyone? Okay, it's just plain as can be. They all drank of the same spiritual drink. That was, remember, that Moses stood there and he struck the rock, and what came out of the rock? Water, that's right. And they all drank of that same spiritual drink, and the rock that followed them was Christ. Okay, there's no mistaking who the rock was, but we can look at another one. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Again, the Apostle Paul. Having been built on the foundation and apostles of the prophets, but who is the chief cornerstone? Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, you know what a cornerstone is, right? The cornerstone, especially in ancient times, when we didn't have the quarrying and the hewing facilities that we have today, you would find a nice, big, solid rock. What kind of a rock? Solid rock. And you would set that stone, and you would level that stone, and you would put it right in the place, and then everything else would build off of the cornerstone. The cornerstone was where the plumb line was. The cornerstone set the pace for the rest of the building. If the cornerstone was off, the building would be off. That's why you had your best stone was your cornerstone. Your most solid stone was your cornerstone. And this analogy taken from Psalm, I believe it's 118, is that Jesus is the cornerstone. Are we all clear? Okay, so who's the cornerstone? Who's that first critical piece in the building of God's people? Jesus Christ, exactly. Let's look at another one here. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 44, Jesus speaking. He says, and who, let's actually go to that verse. Go with me to Matthew chapter 21. Let's look at that in our Bibles because I want you to see the whole context. Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21 and I'm in verse 42. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. Jesus said to them, Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. I still hear some pages. I'll wait for you. Don't worry. Have you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders, what? Rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus speaking to the religious leaders of His day. He says, hey, haven't you read in Psalm 118? Of course, it wasn't called Psalm 118 at the time, but He's quoting here from what we would call Psalm 118. He says, hey, haven't you read? that the very stone that the builder said, nah, we don't need that stone, that that stone became the, the chief stone, the cornerstone, the first stone. Verse 43, Therefore I say to you, Jesus speaking to the religious leaders of His day, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Verse 44, And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomsoever it falls, it will grind him to 
powder. Who is that stone? Who's the chief cornerstone? Jesus. Jesus is basically saying to the religious leaders of his day, you'd better come to grips with who I am. Whoever falls on this stone, whoever confesses that he's a sinner in need of a savior, whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But if you don't fall on this stone, this stone will grind you to powder. Now, quick question here. Where does that imagery, what, does that sound familiar to us, a stone grinding something to powder? Does that sound familiar? Where, what does that sound like? Sounds like Daniel chapter 2, doesn't it? That's exactly the image that Jesus is drawing up here. So the stone that struck the image there was the kingdom of God that grew and became, does anyone remember? A great mountain. Of course, the kingdom of God becomes a great mountain because Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Can you say amen? Okay, so our message is entitled, The Rock That Simply Will Not Roll. Now look at Matthew chapter 7. Since you're there in Matthew, let's make it easy on you. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 24, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus speaking, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, he comes to the end of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded upon the rock. For everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Verse 27, and the rains descended and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now look at verse 28. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. Why? Why were they so surprised? Verse 29, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, Jesus here basically says, if you follow my words, if you obey what I'm telling you here in the Sermon on the Mount and in my other teachings, that's the equivalent of building your house on a rock. But if you want to, hey, you want to have your own ideas, your own opinions, your own traditions, that's like building your house on the sand. Okay? So, we ask the question, who was that rock that Jesus built his church upon? Ah, it would be Jesus. Now go to Matthew chapter 16. Somebody says Peter, and I think they're maybe just being a little facetious. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I, know, I think that was Kevin, and, and he's clever. So uh, Matthew chapter 16. Look with me at verse 13. This is the verse. Now, you've got to hang in there for this verse and really understand it. I mean, do you want to understand this verse? Yeah, me too. So let's look at it. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. Jesus takes a Barna report. He takes a public opinion survey. Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples saying, Fellas, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? I want to know what's the word on the streets. What are people saying about me? Out there in the streets, who are people saying that I am? And then they begin to say, verse 14, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus says, okay, I'm satisfied that you've given me an accurate representation of what others are saying. There he says in verse 15, who do you say that I am? Then Peter speaks up on behalf of the rest of the apostles. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ or the Messiah. Same word. Christos in the Greek is the anointed. Mashiach in the Hebrew is the anointed. You're the anointed. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Here it is, verse 18. Drum roll, please. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. There it is. Jesus is going to build his church on Peter. That's what people say. They say, oh, that, ver that verse plainly teaches that Jesus is going to build his church on Peter. There's just two problems with that. Well, there's three problems with it. Problem number one is it does not agree with the rest of Scripture. We've already seen who is the rock, everyone. Who's the rock? Jesus. Okay, that's the first problem. The second problem is, is that notice he says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But notice just in a few short verses, the gates of hell do prevail against Peter. Verse 21, same chapter, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and then be raised the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine Peter rebuking the Lord of glory? He says, far be it from you, this is not going to happen to you. Verse 23, and he turned and said to Peter, to who everyone? Peter, get behind me, Satan. Question, 
Get behind me, Satan, for you do not savor the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Did the gates of hell prevail against Peter? No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, about 20 seconds later. He says, hey, you, you, you're Peter and on this rock I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. I mean, and moments later, he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be killed and I'll raise again the third day. And Peter says, no, 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 this isn't going to happen. And he says, get behind me, Satan. That's proof positive, number two, the gates of hell did prevail against Peter. And reason number three, it's just a very simple matter of looking at the actual language. Look at it there again in verse 18. I say that you are Peter. The Greek word for Peter is Petros. Now, this doesn't come across in the English, so you need to follow this. You are Petros. The word Petros, you can look it up in any Strong's Concordance of the Greek language. Petros is a small rolling stone or a pebble. Okay? Verily I say unto you, you are Petros. But upon this rock, and the word for rock is Petra. Large, monolithic, unmovable mass of rock, I will build my church. See, it, it, if you look at it in the, in the Greek, it's so plain. First of all, you don't have to know Greek, not at all. The Scripture makes it very clear that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. But, but in the language that's being employed here, it's very simple. He says, you're Peter, you're a little rolling stone. You go this way and that way. You say, let me walk out onto the water and come after you, and then you sink two seconds later. You're a little rolling stone, and I'm glad you're following me, but I need a more stable, sure foundation for my church, and upon this Petra, large, unmovable, monolithic mass of rock, I'm going to build my church. The church is built on Jesus, not on a sinful man. So far, so good? Okay, now let's continue. It gets even better. So notice there, you can fill all of that in there. What about Matthew chapter 16? You should be able to fill every bit of that in, so I'm on page 3. Okay? No problem. You can do that, can't you? Now, I want to go back here to a slide I just missed. And I want to be crystal clear that I am not making fun of anyone. I'm not what? Making fun. I'm over that, okay? I, we, we left those days behind back in junior high school, the nanny nanny boo boo, my dad can beat up your dad, your nose is too big. Those days are over, okay? What we're, what we're interested in is truth. Is what, everyone? Truth. Now, we've already said God is not against people. Can someone say amen? amen. But God is against systems. Against what, everyone? systems that obscure the person of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, we're talking about the changing of God's law. What we're actually going to discover is that right in the heart of God's law, the Ten Commandment law, this power has actually changed God's law. You say, what? Impossible. Now, of course, they can't actually change it, but they've tried to change it. And one of the things that they've done is the second commandment in the catechism. Now, notice, not the Bible, but the what? The catechism, the second commandment, has been removed. Okay, the second commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, the earth beneath, or the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, but showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. In other words, don't worship an idol. Okay, so far so good? That commandment is gone in the catechism. You don't believe me? You go find any cat. It's gone in the Roman Church State's Catechism. It is not there. Well, that doesn't sound so good. Nine commandments. We have to have the Ten Commandments. And so what happened is the Tenth Commandment was divided into two. Okay? So there actually has been an effrontery, a frontal attack on the very law of God. And this actually also begins to involve the Sabbath commandment, which is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all the work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Even that has been attacked and changed, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. The point here is that the Ten Commandment law has been attacked directly by this power, and that's one of the identifiers. Daniel said he would actually think to change the very laws of God and supplant the laws of God with his traditions. With his what? Traditions. traditions. Okay, now, you're there in Matthew chapter 16, should be, so go back one chapter to Matthew chapter 15. And let's just look at a, a very simple outplaying of how this works when tradition comes into contradistinction to God's law. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the what? Traditions of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. 
Now, I recommend that you wash your hands before you eat, but that was a ritual cleansing that they were talking about. Not so much for cleanliness, but a ritual cleansing. Verse 3, He answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the command of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he that curses father or mother, let him be put to death. Which of the Ten Commandments is that? Honor thy father and thy mother. That's number five. That's exactly right. Verse 5 says, But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me, it is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Now, this is very simple. It, there, there was a tradition that basically said, uh, you, okay, first of all, we know that we should all take care of our parents because they took care of us when we were little babies. Amen? Just very simple. That's just good common sense. And, and so too in, in the time of Jesus. So too in the time of the disciples. So too even before that. Honor thy father and thy mother. When, when they get older and they need your help and they need assistance, you take care of them. Not just in terms of physically, but you give them financial resources if they need it. Okay? This is just basic common sense. It's also a biblical principle. But what was happening in the days of Jesus is that they were saying, well, the money that you normally would give to your parents who need their assist your assistance because they're retired and can't work anymore, that money, you can actually take that money and bring it to the temple and God understands. Okay? So there was a tradition that money that could have gone to your parents or should have gone to your parents, if it was given to the temple, God understood. And Jesus says, hey, wait a minute. You're, you're giving my disciples a hard time because they break your silly traditions. You violate the very command of God by your silly tradition that says you can neglect your parents just to make a contribution to the temple. And guess who was the recipient of the monies that went to the temple? The very people that upheld that tradition. Are we all together so far? Okay, so let's pick it up there in verse 7. You hypocrites! He says, you're hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying... Now look at verses 8 and 9. Phenomenal. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And look at verse 9. I mean, it's so phenomenally easy to understand. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, could that be any plainer? When the traditions of man come into conflict with God's law and God's word, which one has to be subordinate to the other? Tradition is subordinate to the laws of God. Can we say amen? Okay, very interesting. So what we find here is that when we go to the teachings, the actual teachings of the Roman church state, tradition has superseded the very laws of God, just as prophecy said that they would think to change the very times and laws of God. Okay? Now, you're there still on your study guide. It says... Really, this is what we would expect when we consider Jesus' words, I'm at the top of page 3, in passages like Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Don't think I came to destroy the law. Uh-uh. That's wrong. Don't think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means, what? Pass from the law. Okay, very simple. Jesus says, hey, listen, even the earth, this solid earth, the terra firma, is less stable than God's law. So far, so good, everyone? Okay, now, buckle your safety belt because this gets incredible. The law of God, okay? The big biblical picture. The law of God is solid, unmovable, and unchangeable. It is a transcript of God's own character. That's the word you'd write in there. It is a transcript of the character of God. Okay? God is holy, the law is holy. God is good, the law is good. God is righteous, the law is righteous. The law is a transcript of the very character of God. Abraham kept God's law, so did Moses, and the many Old Testament prophets, and Jesus, and the disciples. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute, I thought the law began with Moses. I thought, I thought the law began with the, in the days of Moses. No, 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 no. Did Cain sin? Yes or no? Yeah, Cain sinned when he murdered who? Abel, because there was a command that said, Thou shalt not kill. That's exactly right. So, Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5, because Abraham, who everyone? Now, who came first, Abraham or Moses? 
Abraham, right? Because it was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And then the children of Israel went to Egypt for 400 years. And then Moses came out of that. So Abraham is before Moses by several hundred years. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my... Did God have commandments in the days of Abraham? Sure he did. My statutes and my laws. Now what did happen in the days of Moses is that the law of God was codified. It was what, everyone? Codified. He said, what does codified mean? It's a fancy-dancy word for written down. Okay? It was written in the days of Moses. Okay? Now you say, oh, really? It was written in the days of Moses? Now look at this. gets incredible. The law of God was written... The law of God came directly from God to Moses. As if that wasn't enough, the law of God was written. God's Ten Commandment law was written with His own finger. Look at the book of Exodus. Second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 31. I've given you the verse there, but just quickly look at it. Exodus chapter 31. Don't take my word for it. Let's see what the Bible says. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. 31, second book, of the Old, second book of the Old Testament. You can find it. Exodus chapter 31 and verse, what, it, verse everyone? 18, you remember. It says, And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he, he being God, gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So, they were written by who? God wrote them. So you can fill in all the blanks there. The law of God was written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. Now you might be looking at that picture and thinking, hmm, the Ten Commandments look a little blue there. I've never seen that before. I mean, those, who thinks those commandments look a little blue? Yeah, they're purposefully blue. I made them blue, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Now, what happened is, is that Moses comes down the mountain with these two tablets of stone that have the Ten Commandments on them, and God had told him specifically what to do with those commandments. He was to take them and put them, does anyone know? Yeah, you got it. Put them into the Ark of the Covenant, right? You remember uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay, how many people have heard of the Ark of the Covenant before? And we think, oh, it's so holy. Let me tell you what the, let me tell you what the Ark is all about. The ark is a glorified box. That's what the ark is. Do you know what made the ark so special? It wasn't the ark itself. It's what's inside of the ark. If you go to a shoe store and uh, you say, Oh, I really like those shoes. I've got to have that pair of shoes right there. Yep, that's the shoes I want. They say, Well, we'll go see if we have your size. And so they run in the back and sure enough, they come out and they say, um, Yep, we, we don't have the shoes in your size, but we got the box. We, we got the box. Are you going to buy the box? No, because you're interested in what's inside of the box. Now, if they came out and they said, oh, yeah, we, we do have those shoes that fit you right in your size, but we don't have the box, would you take the shoes? Sure, because you want what's in the box, not the box itself. And what really makes the ark special, we think, oh, the ark with the cherubim and the gold plating and the mercy seat. What made the ark so special is that what was inside of it was the very tablets of stone written by God's own finger. Are we all together? I mean, that's what made that thing so special. Phenomenal. In fact, I gave you the verse right there. So it says, the law was placed in the ark. You've got it. Now, why did God write His law in tables of stone? To show that it was temporary, transient, and passing away, right? My dad used to say to me, in fact, I remember one time I was on vacation with him down in Corpus Christi, Texas, and there was a hurricane off. This is years and years ago. There was a hurricane off in the, in the distance. You could actually see the waves rothing and or, you know, frothing up and doing their thing. And mm, I, I mean, I lived in South Dakota. We don't have many oceans in South Dakota. And uh, I was looking at that ocean, and it was hot. And I wanted to get out there, and I said, Dad, can I go swimming? He said, no, you're not going swimming, boy. Uh, so we walked a little further down the beach. I said, Papa, can, I, I got to go swimming. Can I please go swimming? He said, boy, you're not going swimming. I remember I told him my dad was a military dad. Thirty six years in the military. I asked him one more time. I said, Dad, please, can I go swimming? And I'll never forget, he turned around with that index finger that was about that long, and he pointed right at me. He said, boy, you ain't going swimming, and that's written in stone. <laughs> now, what did that mean? Did that mean ask one more time and he'd let me go? No. It meant case closed. If you want to eat tonight, stop asking. Okay? So when God writes His law on tables of stone, what He's saying is it doesn't change. Now, this is phenomenal. Buckle your safety belts. Blue commandments? That's the subheading. Blue commandments? You've got to be kidding me. 
As amazing as it sounds, the Ten Commandments were blue. The Ten Commandments were what? Blue. blue. How do we know that? They were carved out of the very throne of God, which is made of blue sapphire. Open your Bible to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. I'm going to show you something here that is going to absolutely blow your mind. Exodus chapter 24. We're in verse 9. What verse, everyone? Nine. Verse 9. Then Moses went up. This is Mount Sinai. Then Moses went up also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet a paved work of what kind of stone? Sa what color is sapphire? Blue. Blue. A sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity, but on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hands, so they saw God, and they ate and they drank. They go up to, to confirm the covenant. That was common. What, what do we do when we have a wedding? After a wedding, what do you go to? A meal, that's a tradition, that's ancient, because after a covenant is sealed, you have a meal. Here the covenant was sealed and they had a meal. Jesus, when he seals the new covenant in the upper room in the New Testament, has the last supper. So here they're having a meal and they're sealing the covenant. Okay, this happens even today in business partnerships. Great big business deal goes through, a big merger of two companies, they have a big party, they have a dinner. Why? Because they're sealing the covenant. Now look at verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. Now this is interesting. Keep your, keep your finger open right there and look at your study guide. Now, underneath the feet of God there was a pavement like blue sapphire stone. Now I've given you two texts there, Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. You can go look at those verses and it will show you that God's throne is made of sapphire. Okay? I mean, as plain as can be in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 1, Ezekiel says, I saw God's sapphire throne. Okay? So what's his throne made of? Sapphire. sapphire. Now look at this. Note especially verse 12 of Exodus 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. The literal rendering in the Hebrew reads, I will give you tablets of the stone. That's what you'd write in there. Now, that's the definite article. I'm going to give you tablets of the stone. You say, what stone? The only other stone that's mentioned is mentioned two verses before. It's the sapphire stone that God is standing on and that His throne is made of. God says, you come up, I'm going to give you two tablets of the stone. The only other stone that's mentioned in context is that sapphire stone. Now, it gets even better. Look at this. It's a specific stone. The only stone mentioned in this passage is the one found in verse 10, a sapphire stone. So the Ten Commandments were carved out of that blue sapphire stone that makes up God's standing platform and throne. Talk about awesome. And look at Exodus 32, verse 16. I've written it in here for you. Now, the tablets were the work of who? God. God. We, always, we like to say that God wrote it with His own finger, but according to that verse, not only did God write it, God made those tablets. Do you know what he made them out of? A blue sapphire stone. Now the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on tablets. So both the tablets and the writing were the work of God. You say amen? Well, that you, we're just getting started. Look at the next paragraph. The Jews were required to wear blue tassels on the borders of their garments. How many of you knew that? Okay. Open your Bibles to Numbers <laughs> chapter 15. I appreciate those responses. Numbers chapter 15. You're in Exodus. Come on. See if you can beat me there, Leviticus, Numbers, chapter what? 15, can you beat me there? I'm there. Numbers 15, verse 37. Okay? Numbers 15, 37. I got 11 minutes. Okay, 11 minutes and 30 seconds. Let's go. Numbers 15. Numbers what, everyone? 15. You got to see this. This is out of this world. Verse 37. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses. Who spoke to Moses? So this was God's idea. Okay? Verse 38, speak to the children of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. What, what is this, a fashion statement? I mean, why is God so interested in the blue? Why blue? Look at verse 39. He tells us why blue. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the what? The commandments of who? The Lord and 
do them. Now notice this, this is phenomenal. That you may not follow the harlotry. That's what it says. You, do you, I don't want you to be a harlot, leave my commandments and go after the world, that you may not follow, follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy, for I am your God. I am the Lord God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Isn't this fascinating? God says, Moses, tell the children of Israel that if they're my people, the Jewish people, they're going to put a fringe on the borders of their garment, and there's going to be a tassel there, and that tassel has to be blue. And then he says, because I want them to remember my commandments. Now, why blue? Why would blue remind them of the commandments? Because the commandments were written on blue sapphire stone. You think, wow, that's amazing. I didn't know that. Well, it gets even better. Again, we're just getting started. Look at this now. It says, uh, where am I at? Here I am. I'm at the Macedonian Cultural Arts Center. That's where I'm at. Here we go. Now, all oh, this is phenomenal. Open your Bible to the book of Revelation. Okay, Revelation 17. Now, you've already learned a lot more about the book of Revelation than you think. What's a woman in Bible prophecy? Church. A church. What's a beast in Bible prophecy? A kingdom. So what you find in Revelation chapter 17 is a woman on a beast. Now, think about it. A woman on a beast would be a church that's in control of the state. You see, that's very simple. A woman in Bible prophecy is a church. A beast in Bible prophecy is a nation. So here in Revelation chapter 17, you have a woman, uh, an unfaithful woman, a harlot woman on the back of a beast. And so you have an unfaithful church in charge of the state. Oh, oh it's going to get better. Watch. Uh, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. And one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Hey, come here, I want to show you something. The judgment of the great harlot or whore who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This all sounds familiar. Verse 4. And the woman was arrayed, note these three colors, in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her head a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now this is fascinating. Verse 6 says that this woman was drunk with the blood of the saints. So this is a persecuting, unfaithful church. Okay? In Bible prophecy, in fact, look right there in your study guide. A church, uh, a chaste woman would be a faithful church with one husband. A harlot woman would be an unfaithful what? Church with numerous lovers. Okay? Now, I want you to notice the three colors that that woman was wearing. See if you can remember them. What three colors? Purple and scarlet and gold. Now, go to Exodus 28. Phenomenal. Exodus chapter 28. Here God gives very specific instructions to Moses about how the priests were to dress, okay? Everything was specific. Had to be just a certain way. Sometimes people have a hard time reading the last part of Exodus and all of Leviticus. You know, you, you get trapped up in there. And you, Beloved, listen. Leviticus is an instruction manual. The last half of Exodus is an instruction manual. God was giving them very explicit instructions how to conduct themselves in the sanctuary and how to build the sanctuary and how to dress in the sanctuary and how to perform the rites and rituals of the sanctuary. Are we all together, everyone? Yes. So in Exodus 28, God says, this is how Aaron and his sons are supposed to dress. Exodus chapter 28, beginning in verse 31. You shall make the robe of the ephod, that was the, what the, the priests wore, all of what? Blue. Blue. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. It shall have a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so it does not tear. And upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet all around its hem and bells of gold between them all. Wow, isn't this interesting? Look at the colors that the high priest was supposed to wear. Purple, scarlet, blue, and gold. Now, what were the three colors that the woman was wearing? Scarlet, purple, and gold. So she's wearing the colors of the high priest, but what color is absent? Why? Because she's forgotten the commandments and the law of God. Are we all together? Okay. Let's, let's keep going then. What is the purpose of the law? Okay, some people say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, are you? I thought we were New Testament Christians. 
I thought, I thought we were New Testament Christians. Oh, what's all this talk about the law? Well, remember, we already read in the book of Revelation, the book of what? Revelation, Revelation that God's last day... Is Revelation in the New Testament or the Old Testament? <laughs> New Testament. So it says in the New Testament that God's people will be keeping His law. Amen? Okay, now you might be thinking, Whoa, Pastor Asher, that's great. You made that up. You wish I made it up. I didn't make it up. The harlot woman of Revelation chapter 17, she was wearing gold and purple and scarlet, but she didn't have what? Blue. Now look at this. This is taken from the Legends of the Jews, volume 3, by Lewis Ginsburg, page 118 and 119. Look at this. The Jews, beloved, this is what the, the Jews have historically believed about the Ten Commandment law, that it was written on the very stone taken from God's throne. Look at this. Moses departed from the heavens with the two tab t tables on which the Ten Commandments were engraved, and they were made of a sapphire-like stone. That's what the Jews have believed. Those Ten Commandments weren't made out of some rock. Some rock that Moses just found in the Sinai desert floor. No, no, no. They were carved out of a blue sapphire stone. And look at this one. Also from Ginsburg's The Legends of the Jews, volume 6, page 49. Ancient Jewish scholars state that the sapphire employed for the tables was taken from the throne of glory. Now, beloved, I want you to think about that. The, the, the law of God is taken from the very throne of God. Now, remember, where was that law placed? In the ark. Do you know what the ark is a symbol of? The throne of God. That's exactly right. You had the two angels that came up. And what was between those two angels? The, she the mercy seat. What was above the mercy seat? The Shekinah glory, which represented the very presence of God Himself. It was the presence of God Himself. And so here, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, is the mercy seat, the throne. And what's under the throne? The tablets of stone made out of blue sapphire, cut from the very throne of God. And the Antichrist power says, Pah, we can do a... You what? You're... Can you do away with God's throne? impossible. Now let's wrap this up, beloved. First of all, the law is like a mirror. It is not like a bar of soap. Okay? What is the purpose of the law? Right there on your sheet, the law is like a mirror. The law is designed to show us two things. Number one, the righteousness of God. And number two, the unrighteousness of man. That's the purpose of the law. You ever had a black bean on your tooth? You ever gone out and eaten Mexican and got a bean on your tooth? Anyone ever done that? Big old piece of parsley on your tooth. You ever done that? Okay, for those of you who are married, have you ever got home and been washing your face before you go to bed and then you see that big piece of bean on your tooth? Ever done that? Yeah, yeah, it happens to me too. I remember one time it happened to me. I turned to my wife. I said, sweetie, we had been visiting with our friends for two or three hours after we ate. I said, whoa, 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 sweetie, do you see this? Can you see that, sweetie? Say, oh, yeah, you got a great big piece of bean. I've been meaning to tell you that all night. Got a great big... So, sweetie, I got news for you. I can't see that. My eyes don't do that. They don't do that. Okay? So, I need you to tell me that that's there, right? You're my help me. Help me out now. Okay? The mirror told me that I had a problem. The mirror didn't solve my problem. Someone say amen. The mirror told me I had a need. The mirror tells me I need help. The law is like a mirror. This is what James says in the New Testament. A man looks into the perfect law of liberty, and when we look into that mirror, we see that we are all unrighteous. There is none that does good. No, not one. The law tells us God is righteous. We're unrighteous. We need a Savior. I mean, can you imagine taking that mirror and trying to scrub your face up? The purpose of God's law, beloved, is to show us how righteous He is and conversely how unrighteous we are and then drive us to Jesus because we need a Savior to take away our unrighteousness and our sin. Someone say amen. amen. That's the purpose of the law. We don't keep the law of God in order to be saved. In fact, go right down there on your study guide. The underlined portion says, So God's faithful will keep His law because they love Him, not in order to be saved, but because they are saved. And some people today say, oh, you know, don't worry about that old law. The law has been done away with. The law has been nailed to the cross. Whoa! 
Something was nailed to the cross, but let me tell you wasn't, what wasn't nailed to the cross. It wasn't God's Ten Commandment law. I mean, which one of those commandments you want to get rid of there? I just gave them to you quickly and brief. Which one do you want to throw out? The one that says you can have other gods, number one? Anyone here want to throw that one out? Okay, how about number two that says don't worship an image? Anyone want to throw that one out? Okay, how about number three that says we're not going to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain? Anyone here? I mean, any New Testament Christian want to say we don't need that? Okay, how about number four that says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Let's throw that one out, right? How about the one that says honor your, your father and your mother? Should we get rid of that one as New Testament Christians? Oh, but, but the one that says don't kill, that's for the Old Testament. I don't think so. How about the one that says thou shalt not steal or commit adultery? No, what about the one that says don't lie? Or the one that says don't... Which one are you going to get rid of, beloved? Amen. The difference is the New Testament was trying to communicate to us that we don't keep the law in order to be saved, but because we are saved, the law tells us we need a Savior. The law drives us to Jesus, and Jesus saves us. Amen? Amen. And then God gives us power to keep His law, not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, the law is like a mirror. I want to ask two questions as we close tonight. My ministry partners are going to be handing out a dis, uh, decision card. In fact, they're going to stand up and do that right now. My ministry partners are just ready to go, just like that, a ministry, uh, decision card. Two questions tonight as we close. Number one, has this presentation been clear, yes or no? Do you see the conflict over the law of God that God's law is eternal and lasting, but others are going to try to take away from that law? Do you see the conflict, yes or no? Yes. Daniel chapter 7 says that, that the anti-Christian power is actually going to seek to try to do away with God's law. Yet God's law is eternal, it's immutable, it's everlasting. We saw in Revelation that, that that woman was actually wearing the colors of the high priest, but she didn't have blue. Why? Because she had forgotten God's commandments. Beloved, we do need the law, but the law doesn't save us. Someone say amen to that. Amen. I want to say it again. The law doesn't save us. Only Jesus can save us. Is that true? Yes or no? Okay. So you've got a card there in front of you. I just want to quickly go over it. Please take a moment to fill that out. Our ministry partners are putting these cards in your hands. If anyone needs one, just lift your hand up to heaven. I see one there. Excellent. Number one, it says, I understood tonight's presentation. Please, please fill these out. It helps me to know if, if we're getting it. I look at, I look at these cards, and it's very helpful to me to know, are we getting it? Number one, I understood tonight's presentation. Number two, I reaffirm my personal acceptance of Jesus Christ's death for me. You want to do that? Just check it. Say, yeah, tonight, hallelujah, glory to God. I, I reaffirm my commitment to Jesus. I'll do that. If I had a pen up here, I'd fill that out. No problem. Number three, for the first time, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior from sin and death. You've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior before? This would be the time to do it. Or maybe you did a long time ago, so long ago you can barely remember, and you want to come back. You check that. Number four, I have wandered. That should be W-A, wandered from God and His plan for my life and I want to return to Him. And check that if that applies to you. Number five, I'd like to be baptized. As we've already said, Thursday night we begin our baptismal class right over here. Praise the Lord. We're going to have a baptism at the end of this meeting, amen? Not this meeting, but at the end of the month we're going to have a powerful baptism.